Jason Reza Giorgiani. Thank you for coming on the show. Pleasure to be with you, Alan. Thanks for the invitation. I'm so excited for this. You're very polymathic. That's definitely and a great storyteller, an eloquent speaker, excellent author of six plus books now, and founder of the Prometheism movement, which is exciting to talk about. I'm looking forward to that. My friend David Johnson, actually, DJ, he pointed me out to you, and he was like, check him out. And I was like, he's great. And then I requested you on email and Facebook, and you were like, my fiance Nassim is in LA. I'm here for several months. We can make this work. And boom, here we are. You know, the first thing that jumped out at me when you messaged me was that you used the name Atlas. My first book was Prometheus and Atlas. And Atlas. So yeah. that's an interesting synchronicity. Why, why do you use Atlas? Why did you pick that as your avatar? Yeah, that's a perfect way to ask it. Why pick that as the avatar? Well, it picks me. You know? Well, yeah, yeah, I understand that. Well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then it really resonates because, and I noticed that as well with Prometheus and Atlas, was that in a sense not only taking on such a great burden of maximizing human potential, but also of having a cartography for who we mm -hmm. are, why we're here, where we're yeah. going, that type of thing. Yeah. Well, you know, in Prometheus and Atlas, I use Atlas as um, an archetypal symbol for a kind of post-paradigmatic science uh, with the idea being that if we pay proper attention to the kind of data that parapsychologists have been amassing for well over a century now, what's at stake isn't simply another scientific revolution like the Copernican or the Darwinian revolution or even the quantum revolution. What's at stake is a scientific revolution that would make us aware for the first time of the way in which our thinking is constrained by paradigms or dogmatic frameworks. So when you're dealing with psychical research, um, and that becomes a basis for revolutionizing uh, various fields of, uh, sci you know, of, of science and technological innovation, um, there is the potential there to become conscious of the ways in which the mind is subconsciously or unconsciously constrained by certain presuppositions that uh, delimit or, or constrain what theories are even possible in the first place, right? So Atlas to me is a vision of a post-paradigmatic science where we can work with different atlases of the world, understanding that our scientific theories aren't um, mirroring nature. They're not mirrors that are intended to provide us with an adequate representation of nature, where if we polish the mirror, you know, uh, rigorously enough, we'll get a perfect reflection of the structures in the universe. Rather, our scientific um, theories are really models. And, you know, Atlas is also a term for a model, like the Atlas of the Human Body in medical science. So Atlas, to me, is, is uh, post-paradigmatic science, where we can work simultaneously with theoretical frameworks that appear to be contradictory, but that we recognize ultimately only serve a practical purpose. Beautiful. That's that synthesis approach that you and I both prioritize and that in very many ways it seems like that next step that we are taking with our technologies is enabling those blind spots mm -hmm. to be very clearly seen around, well, which cognitive biases do I actually have and other things around maximizing our both individual and collective potential. And I love the way that you explain the way of how do you take something that seems to be the silos that exist in the, like the analogy that we like making here is for the, an organism, you take the human body, the heart and the gut and the brain and the liver and pancreas and all these systems have to have a strong amount of 
interbody communication in order for it to function. And on a similar level, we have these silos right now happening between the tech giants in the United States, uh, the geopolitical climate of the US and China and Saudi Arabia and Russia and all these geopolitical entities as well, and the tech conglomerates in China as well. And so there's the, the data is extremely siloed. It's extremely asymmetric between the users and the co corporations. And so in a sense, there's a de siloification and a decentralization and a sovereignty that happens at the level of, of the individual, which then enables, like you say, these different, like my map of my data on a social media platform to also be able to talk to the map of my data of my consumer purchase history. That's right. And stuff like that. And yeah. at the biological level as well, I have this youthful homeostatic capacity of an 18 year old. I remember 10 years mm -hmm. ago, I could just do everything. And now I'm 28 and I'm like, man, this back thing is mm -hmm. crazy. And so at a biometric level as well, right? The cartography of the human atlas, those biometrics as well to be able to speak with all these other aspects to our lives, these maps interweaving. Yeah, you know, you mentioned sovereignty, the kind of sovereignty that comes with being able to flip between different maps of the world, right? And be more conscious of the presuppositions that subconsciously constrained your theorization before that, right? Um, and I also use Atlas as a symbol of sovereignty in Prometheus and Atlas, because of course, Atlas was the king of Atlantis. Atlantis means the realm of Atlas. Uh, in Plato's, you know, writings about Atlantis. And so um, the idea of Atlas as a sovereign, not necessarily as a king of a political realm, but as the sovereign individual who, by being conscious and aware and no longer uh, subconsciously constrained by certain presuppositions, is bearing the burden of awareness and enlightenment and becoming a sovereign individual, right, who... Uh, is capable of working with different atlases in order to um, maximize his evolutionary potential. Yes, so well said. Ooh, I love it. Giving even more meaning to what is atlas for, for me as well. It's just, thank you for that. That's a v super valuable part of the intro of the convo. A place where you speak really eloquently is history, which is very interesting. There is a lot of beauty to the way that we are able to be present right here, right now. A hundred billion or so humans lived and died before us today to have the abundance that we have today and the gratitude that we can have for that is extremely crucial the running water the abundant food the clean air the electricity education healthcare, economics all these things yet we had a hundred million plus deaths that happened in the 20th century. <laughs> um, 70 million as a consequence of war, I believe. Yeah. And so there's a lot to unpack about the, if we take this from the perspective of the way that a simulation emerges. Mm -hmm. Because at any point in the tree of possibilities that the United Kingdom and Europe coming to the North America, if that didn't happen, what would be the difference on a planetary level? A change in any of these major wars could have just completely altered the way that our planet is 
and we like to hypothesize that those are all already running in all of the multiverses at, at the same time as this one. So the question would be something like, how do you see in our historical evolution the geopolitical interplays that have led us to the point where we're at today and what's been some of the most key variables in that process as well as some of the most unseen things behind the veil like you've talked about operation paperclip and many of these other things yes okay first of all it's not clear how different our history or rather not our history but how different the structure of our world would be if one or another uh, colonial conquest had or hadn't taken place. And one reason why a very advanced civilization, a civilization uh, which from our perspective would be archontic or angelic or demonic, um, one of the reasons why they would run a global simulation would be to develop a science of history. And by science of history, I mean you would want to see how much stayed the same depending on the variables that you changed, right? I mean, uh, we might be surprised at how much of the world would be the same if, let's say, the French had conquered North America rather than the British, right? They made an attempt after all. Um, or, you know, what it would be like if uh, the Roman Empire had never fallen to the barbarians, whatever. Um, a lot might be the same. We don't know. And one of the reasons why you would run a global simulation is to start to see the parallels between alternate histories and develop uh, predictive laws of social evolution. Okay, so um, as hard as it is for us to take the idea that there are programmers sitting up there and watching the atrocities of the Second World War unfold, right? Um, if we approach it from out of the mindset of a social psychologist, we might begin to understand uh, why someone would want to run a simulation like that. Um, maybe the things that they learn about law-like developments in history from within this simulation are, you know, um, are uh, data that they're going to apply to social engineering in their own world. Okay. So it's an open question how much of our world would be the same uh, in terms of our infrastructure, our quality of life, and so forth if one or another civilization hadn't fallen or if one or another conquest hadn't taken place. Now, if you ask me you know, what the key turning points in our history have been and the ways in which they relate to the question of the esoteric or the occult, uh, what's been hidden, you know, um, and, and uh, you know, what transpires behind the veil or behind the curtain of uh, recorded history, I would have to say that uh, it's fairly clear to me that the major turning points in our recorded history were the Abrahamic revelations, mm. uh, that there's a qualitative distinction between pagan religions, whether it's Greek paganism, the Olympian pantheon, um, or Hindu paganism, or Mithraism, uh, there's a qualitative distinction between the pagan religions and religions based on divine revelation of a scripture, uh, whether that's Judaism, Christianity, or Islam. And so I would say that the key turning points in our history, our version of the simulation, are those moments when the, uh, I don't want to say necessarily the fate of a civilization, but the developmental trajectory of a major civilization was altered by a purported religious revelation. So, and this isn't necessarily, you know, uh, the life, time, and the teachings of Christ, but the moment 300 years later when the Council of Nicaea canonized Christianity and uh, ultimately institutionalized it as a theocratic basis for a reorganization of the Roman Empire. So that would certainly be one major... Um, fork in the road, one major watershed moment yep. in our recorded history. Another would be the uh, conquest and um, forced conversion of the Sasanian Persian Empire to Islam. Uh, Interesting that you pick this one as the second one. 
Yeah, well, it's it's certainly the second most significant one after the Christianization of the Roman Empire because the thing uh, that's lost on a lot of Westerners is that you know Plato, Aristotle, much of the intellectual heritage of classical antiquity, the same kinds of books that were in the Library of Alexandria when Bishop Kirill and the you know early Christians torched the Library of Alexandria, the same uh, treasure troves of knowledge that were in places like Alexandria and Corinth and other cities of the classical Roman Empire were also in Iran up to the moment when the Arab Muslims conquered Iran uh, around 650 AD. So that whole flowering of the Renaissance and the Industrial Revolution, which took a thousand years to take place in Europe after the Christianization of Rome, that development could have taken place in Iran as early as you know, 600, 700 AD had it not been for this traumatic rupture on account of the Arab Muslim conquest of Iran and the collapse of the Sassanid Empire. Uh, and again, this represents a moment when a pagan culture was radically transformed and re-engineered by a purported religious revelation. So I would mm -hmm. say that these are the, the mm -hmm. moments of greatest divergence and you know the, the, watershed, um, the watershed moments in our recorded history where if there are programmers behind the curtain this is uh, this is the moment at which they're altering significant variables to see how the developmental trajectory of a society can be, you know, altered. It was interesting when you said that the takeaway of a simulation at a civilizational emergence level could be something like the ways that the dynamics interplay between the sovereign agents there that then evolve some sort of social rules and laws around their own sovereignty and the way that their cultural dynamics work. That was interesting because you run that a trillion or more times and then you begin finding a meta pattern and there's a bunch of cool things there and then it was also interesting when you said that the you know zoroaster is such a fascinating the axial age in general is such a fascinating sort of moment and of course there is the the practices of the indus valley especially that run even prior to that where there's an investigation inward is basically the essence an investigation into what is the nature of consciousness and then that leads to an also an answer of what is the nature of reality is mm -hmm. this consciousness eternal is it infinitely being colored by these creation designs and these realities and is that god is that what god is is that what source is is that what we are and so the profundity of those revelations were in many ways such a pivotal moment. And so it makes sense that you sort of kind of also mention that. Yet at the same time, the, the Abrahamics have this profound corpus of stories. Again, like the parable of the prodigal son is such a one that's so deeply relevant here, where rather than seeking for happiness externally, that we hit a breaking point and we turn inward and we understand that the well of honey is actually located under the rock of that contracted egoic separate entity. So let's play there. Would you say that the revelations around the mystic traditions, mysticism being union with God or union with the absolute, would you say that these perennial wisdoms across the mystic traditions, would you say that those types of inquiries and revelations were the prime pivotal moments on the trajectory of a civilization? Yeah, before I can even begin to answer that, we have to clarify a few things. Yes. Uh, 
first of all, when you say perennial moments of revelation, it seems to me, and I may be hearing this mistakenly, that you're conflating the sages of what you described as the axial age coming out of Carl Jasper's analysis of that whole period of history, that you're conflating the sages of the so-called axial age like Lao Tzu, Zarathustra, I don't know, Heraclitus and some of the other Greek sages, um, Buddha, that you're conflating those with uh, the prophets who brought religious revelations. Is that, am I hearing you correctly? And that you're classifying all of these as mystical revelations of some kind. When I say perennial mystic traditions, my understanding is You're thinking is that about like Christian mysticism, Sufism, and you're putting those on a level with the sages of the Axial Age, right? Yeah. It, okay, well, here, here's why I ask. Okay, here's why I and ask. I, and I know I'd also like to say that when we hear things like I and my father are one yeah, yeah, out yeah, of yeah, the you know, Abrahamics, yeah, it's also the same thing colored differently sure, with sure. Tatvam Asi. I get you. We I get that. you. Yeah. I get you. I have oh. a serious problem with this oh. way of thinking. Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay. So the point I was trying to make earlier when you asked me about if, if we are wow. to think about our history as a simulation, what are the watershed moments where are the variables being significantly altered? And I suggested that it's the moments when the re religious revelations take place, particularly Judeo-Christianity and Islam. What I meant was that the pagan cultures uh, into which these revelations were injected were qualitatively different, not just in terms of their social organization, but also in terms of what counted for wisdom and, you know, a uh, mystical path to enlightenment, okay? So I see what you've described as, and I'll get to this question of the Axial Age in a second, okay? But in a moment. But what you described as the sages of the Axial Age, Heraclitus, Buddha, Zarathustra, I see them as uh, seeking wisdom through the power of their own intellect and through the direct experience that they accumulated in their lives and offering that experience up to seekers through their writings, okay, um, so that whoever has the inclination to devote themselves to intellectual cultivation can pursue that path toward enlightenment. I think that's generally characteristic of uh, pagan mystical traditions whether they're in Greece or in India. Revelation is based on heavenly authority. It, it is based on a moral code uh, that is disclosed from on high with the seal of divine authority. And these types of revelations really injected themselves into and you know, vectored themselves into and re-engineered civilization on a large scale at two points. Mm -hmm. One with the Judeo-Christian takeover of Rome and the other with the Muslim takeover of the Persian Empire. Okay. Follow and on. I would push back okay. against your characterization and say that even the Which kind has of... has led to where we're at today yeah, in modernity. Ex ex well, it led to a thousand years of darkness. And had it not been for that, in my view, we'd have cities on Mars right now. So hmm. Uh, hmm. I would say that now the case of Judeo-Christianity and Islam are significantly different from one another. I would say that even the type of mysticism that you see in the Gospels, and particularly in the Gospel of John, is a uh, crypto-pagan form of mysticism. Let me give you a, a brief argument for why that might be the case. If you look at about 150 years after the time of... Uh, 150 uh, AD, okay, 150 years after Jesus was supposedly born, you see that all these statues are cropping up around the Roman Empire of a certain Apollonius of Tiana. And there are stories being promulgated about this man's life. And ultimately, a very famous biography of Apollonius of Tiana is written by a prominent Roman author called Philostratus. And the life of this Apollonius of Tiana, a sage from Syria who spent most of his life in Judea and was ultimately uh, almost crucified and barely escaped with his life, the miracles he performed, the teachings that he uh, expounded in Judea are an almost exact parallel for major elements in the life of Jesus. And in particular, the Pythagorean hermetic teaching of Apollonius of Tiana 
almost perfectly mirrors the mystical elements of the Gospel of John and of the Gnostic Gospels. So you really have to wonder how much of the mystical element even of the Gospels when they were canonized, you know, in the period of the, the Nicene Councils and so forth, comes from a Pythagorean hermetic uh, pagan mystical tradition. So even in its formative stages, whatever constituted the Christian revelation, whatever was being injected into the, uh, you know, to recode the Roman Empire, right, um, was amalgamated with pre-existing pagan mysticism. In the case of Islam, the Mohammedan revelation, which you see in the Quran, which you see in the Hadith, in the traditions attributed to Muhammad, is very lacking in any kind of mysticism that you could um, that you could analogize to Tatvam Asi, to the spirit of the Upanishads and so forth. It's very lacking Whereas in the Quran the and the Hadith. Whereas the Sufi metaphysics Whereas have it's overflowing with it. With over, yeah. And, you know, I've studied this in depth, at length and in depth, and my conclusion is that Sufism is, uh, it's, it's crypto-Mithraic, it's crypto-Zoroastrian, it's an attempt to preserve the pagan spirituality of the Persian Empire in the face of a very draconian, authoritarian religious revelation, a very inquisitorial religious revelation. Uh, so I would say that um, it's for good reason that the Sufi sages were persecuted and in many cases martyred as heretics by the Islamic authorities. They were uh, actually perverting the revelation uh, that was injected into the Sassanid Persian Empire. Um, so you have to be very careful in conflating these revelations, you know, uh, by Jesus or Muhammad with the wisdom of the sages of the so-called Axial Age. And then I think you have to be very careful about the Axial Age. Carl Jaspers framed the concept of the Axial Age. He was a student of Martin Heidegger. And his idea was that you had all these sages crop up in different parts of the world, basically with the same, you know, uh, expressing the same message of enlightenment and more or less the same path to wisdom, right, in the vernacular of their culture. But that there is a perennial wisdom that they are all uh, branches of and expressions of, quasi-independent expressions of. And I, I think that this thesis doesn't hold water when you really study history. If you look at the so-called Axial Age, you're talking about the age of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. And these places were not geographically distinct from one another. They were all on the margins of the very same empire that was interconnected with the most magnificent royal road system built in history until the time of the Romans. Uh, so, you know, the Greeks and the Indians had lots of commerce and interaction with one another. And it's not surprising that some of the same ideas um, that you see in the fragments of Heraclitus are also in the Upanishads and vice versa. I even argue in my book, Iranian Leviathan, that um, this figure we call Lao Tzu was actually a wandering Scythian sage who at one point was connected to the Persian royal court and that you know, he winds up being exiled to northern India and then ultimately sojourning uh, in northwestern China and becomes the basis for the formation of this character of uh, Lao Tzu. And I draw comparisons between his teaching and, uh, you know, the, the wisdom in the fragments of Heraclitus and point to their common origin in archaic Iranian thought. So, you know, you got to look at the context of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, which connected all of these places where you have these sages arise and promulgate these teachings. Um, and then I think when you do that, uh, this thesis of perennialism becomes a little less compelling. Which is not to say that there isn't some transcendent wisdom that these people were all engaged with, but there's also a lot of very real sociological and, and cultural um, connection there, connectivity there. If I understand correctly, would it be that your understanding is that rather than with my understanding, it's something like the mystic traditions across the planet are all there's many analogies to use one of them is they are all ice cream 
in that they are different flavors of ice cream. Another one is that they are all faces or paths that are all pointing to the same one end. And so if my understanding is correctly, that sort of perennial philosophy and wisdom doesn't account so much for you. You see the revelation in the Abrahamic tradition as what ended up creating the modern civilization that we have downstream. Uh, I, I see it as responsible for a lot of the dysfunction of our modern civilization, a lot of its schizophrenia, because it disrupted organic and um, organic and personal paths to enlightenment that you found in various pagan cultures. So like, for example, the teaching of Buddha in northern India is entirely geared on personal cultivation and on an individual path toward enlightenment. The same thing was being taught in Alexandria. Yet you have the noble eightfold path that is very similar to the Ten Commandments. I would com totally reject that. I would categorically reject that. First of all, if you look in the book of Exodus, and then remember the book of Leviticus follows the book of Exodus, okay? Um, and the commandments as they're presented in Exodus are then mirrored in Leviticus and expanded upon. And when you look at Exodus and Leviticus together, what you see is that this notion of there being Ten Commandments is a later historical construction. There are many more than Ten Commandments. Or you, if you're familiar with Confucius's four books, five classics, there's sure. also lots in the Analects and whatnot on morality and on these styles of wisdoms. Yeah. It's very perennial, in a sense. I think it's fair to, to draw a comparison between Confucius and Buddha and to sit down and, and show where these thinkers overlap and where they significantly diverge. And, okay, in the part of Iranian Leviathan where I talk about Lao Tzu and Buddha, and I argue that these are actually the same figure, yeah, I, you know, that'll throw you for a trip, but I argue that Gautama was actually... Uh, that Lao Tzu, the legend of Lao Tzu, is based on Gautama sojourning in Central Asia. In any case, it's been the, the, the case that historically, both Taoism and Buddhism have clashed in a very violent way with Confucianism in China. Both Taoism and Buddhism were relegated to an extreme minority fringe phenomenon in Chinese cultural history because of the institutional dominance of Confucianism, which saw both of these uh, wisdom traditions as uh, extremely dangerous and destabilizing heresies. Okay, So uh, from the Chinese Confucianist perspective, certainly neither Taoism nor Buddhism were compatible with Confucianism. In fact, they were seen as grave threats to society. That's one thing. Then if you try to take any of these and compare them to the Ten Commandments, I say hold your horses, okay? Because, I mean, we're dealing with the most diametrically opposed approaches to uh, the cultivation of the human character that's imaginable. The commandments, and again, they're not ten. There are many of them, and they include commandments about how to treat your slaves, since slavery is institutionalized in the Bible, particularly in Exodus and in Leviticus. There are all kinds of commandments that have to do with, you know, uh, terrible treatment of women in society and how to properly treat your slaves and, and all kinds of other things that are inimical to any kind of cultivation of wisdom, right? And then this framing of them as 10 is, is really, uh, you know, it's a retrospective historical revisionism. But even if there were 10 commandments, they're commandments that come from down, you know, come down from on high with the seal of authority of the one true God, uh, and consequently they're fundamentally different in their nature from precepts that are being presented by a sage as constructive guidance on the path to enlightenment. These, to me, are as divergent as, as anything. Fair. It's fascinating to me to hear you hit the tennis ball back like this and it's really refreshing because it's a perspective that in many ways, rather than finding the similarities, 
is finding those differences and making those clear. And I think that's a really important perspective to also share. It's important, especially if you're seeking the similarities, right? I mean, if you really want to identify commonalities um, of a psychological nature, of a psychical nature, uh, in terms of the human quest for enlightenment, let's say the humanoid quest for enlightenment, then you have to understand the differences first, right? And the fact of the matter is that we don't even have a data set that's broad enough to be able to even properly ask the question of whether there's a perennial wisdom. We would need to look at Vulcan philosophy. We would need to look at, you know, the philosophy of, uh, I don't know, people on the Wookiee planet, sure. okay? Uh, we need a cosmic scope and, and, for empirical and, and that's research. greater than one. Sure. Yeah, and, yeah, and on that basis, we could then determine whether there's a convergent evolution of consciousness in the cosmos where, you know, something like the humanoid form of organization is a teleology, is a kind of goal-directedness built into nature, and whether, uh, because the humanoid form is common across the cosmos as a higher evolutionary form, whether it's the case that all life is tending toward a single endpoint of the evolution of consciousness. An attractor. Yeah. yeah. That, now, that may be the case. Uh, but, you know, we don't know. We really, And that's the empirical mindset. That's the scientific mindset that's characteristic, I think, uh, definitive of Western civilization. And I think that, you know, it's been a grave sin for modern scientists to marginalize you know the data of psychical research and not to take the occult seriously as a dimension of human experience and, and so forth yeah. but on the other hand i see that kind of radical commitment to empiricism as a great strength of the western attitude as compared to say you know eastern paths toward enlightenment yeah and that's ultimately what we share on the show a lot which is the synthesis of Again, very broadly speaking, the East and the West, or very broadly speaking, spirituality and science, or very broadly speaking, indigeneity and modernity. There's many different ways to sort of split into two and then say, ah, drain the dirty bathwater, uplift the clean baby, and bring them together into one. It seems as though even I really appreciate the cosmic perspective of having an end that's greater than one being really valuable here in terms of, oh, let's analyze other secretions of life on celestial bodies orbiting stars that then gain self-awareness and pierce the veil and understand their metaphysics and then see if it correlates <laughs> with ours. It's good. That's it's solid. That's really valuable. It is. And at the same time, in a sense, we are a micro version of that, where you have all of these little cultures that have blossomed across the planet that are all in what appears to be pointing towards the same mountain top. And even the word, in the sense, the words themselves are like God or Tao or Brahmin or even the universal wave function like in to a certain extent it seems to be a source or infinity or eternity as much as these word clouds have different descriptors around these individual words the word clouds also have a tremendous amount of overlap and similarity and that seems to be the mountain top that it is pointing towards. And I, I do agree that there is this sort of, this a deep style of what's called self-inquiry or self-abiding to what is thought of as the witness or the observer or the I am or the self, which is in a sense the I of God that we share that is being colored by different experience. And that's sort of mm -hmm. what much of the perennial wisdom points towards and yet it also points towards things like this being a appearance this being a dream this being an illusion and that the 
physicalism, the form, as quantum mechanics is sharing with us now, all is no thing. All is energy. Uh -huh. And so it's becoming more and more clear that what we do at night, a third of our lives, we spend a chunk of that dreaming, taking, we simulate a reality, take the first person perspective into it. Jason, for a period of time, becomes Paul in the streets of London in this dream. And he's having some tea, enjoying his time there. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you wonder, well, that wasn't real. That was a dream. Mm -hmm. And so this simultaneously, whether it's God, source, infinity, eternity, the Tao, Brahman, what have you as an absolute, being a dreamt creation design, uh -huh. an immersion into it, mm -hmm. and coloring that awareness or consciousness with experience. Sure. How do you feel about that? Well, um, I think the refraction of the human personality into the various personas that we assume in dream states and that you know we interact with in dream states could be a metaphor for how our reality is structured. I mean, it could be that you know it's almost cliche at this point. We're all part of God's dream. You know, we're all avatars of some kind of a divine consciousness, um, and you know, our world uh, is not does not have an ontological status that's fundamentally different from that of a dream, okay? That it's a kind of intersubjective dream state, uh, like in the film Inception, for example. And, you know, I agree with you. It's a fascinating um, phenomenon to see how your consciousness individuates itself uh, and gives life to these different personas in the dream state, right? Um, especially if you've ever had the experience as I have of having the same dream continue serially on multiple nights where it's almost like you're going into an alternate reality. And, you know, there are these personalities there that seem to have a life of their own, right? And yet they're your own psyche, uh, you know, sort of refracting itself in various ways. Sure, I mean, that could be a, an analogy for how reality as a whole, whatever reality capital R is, has, you know, as the cosmos as a whole functions. That's possible. Again, we don't know. Um, something that I wanted to say in response to to uh, you know your remarks a little bit uh, a little while back about um, the mind of God, you know, within ourselves. In other words, the microcosm that is reflecting the macrocosm, right? Um, the God within us, as it were, right? S uh, I'll throw this out there and, you know, we can unpack it if you want to. Uh, if not, you know, we could just leave it out there. But I would, I would um, be so bold as to claim that the only way that we are a microcosm of some kind of macrocosmic consciousness is if there is a convergent evolution of consciousness in the cosmos and some kind of super consciousness from the future is engaged in a dynamic relationship with us. To me, that's the only empirically sensible way to frame the claim that our minds are a microcosm of some kind of macrocosm. But here's the problem. If that's how you want to characterize the relationship between the microcosm and the macrocosm, the last thing that God wants is perennialism. Because God is, quote, God, unquote, is a super consciousness at the end of history, which is running out of a future. Okay, and so what God needs from us is a broadening of the field of potential experience. So God would want further differentiation and increasing complexity. And therefore, this macrocosmic consciousness at the end of history would be trying to introduce dissonance and conflict and differentiation so as to see what types of new forms and structures might arise because that being is desperately in need of some kind of change. Okay, That being would be facing suicidal nihilism. And in that case, we would have to save God. 
Okay, God would need us to save her from suicidal despair. And the last thing that that kind of a divine consciousness wants is perennialism, which is going to level everything and try to make everything seem as homogenous as possible. That God would want discord and dynamic creative strife. I feel like it's a perfect segue into the, one of the topics that we definitely wanted to touch on. So it may be that as consciousness pierces the veil and awakens to the nature of its reality, that there is a perennial wisdom that emerges there. And what science and technology and engineering are doing is that they are what appears to be like a complex system that's evolving towards an attractor. It's what it seems like in a very decentralized, unilinear, orthogenic style way, are building towards the metaverse, the synthesis of artificial general intelligence, bio and neurotechnology like Neuralinks, the indistinguishable virtual realities, immersing ourselves into those. And so it may be that as consciousness awakens and pierces its veil and recognizes its true nature, there's a perennialism around that. But then as we enter into what appears to be this, you know, this 21st century, these next hundred years are building out this metaverse, which is what enables that radical differentiation that you speak of, which is all of these indistinguishable virtual worlds that then, as John Smart says in the transcension hypothesis, that we go inward. Well, we go inward and outward at the same time with the cosmic exploration as well as the transcension inward. And that that is a hypothesis. And how do you feel about the differentiation being there at the metaverse level? Yeah, so I, I see these as inextricable phenomena. Um, you know, in Prometheus and Atlas and World State of Emergency, uh, I talk about respectively the spectral revolution, what I call the spectral revolution, uh, the scientific revolution that awaits us um, through a serious recognition of the data amassed by parapsychology. And then in World State of Emergency, I talk about the technological singularity, the convergent advancement of various uh, you know, singularity level technologies. And then in Prometheism, I synthesize these two and, and talk about them in a, in a comparative way and make the argument that the technological singularity will force us to go through the spectral revolution because, you know, as materialistic as these various um, technological research programs appear to be, whether it's genetic engineering or the attempt to develop artificial general intelligence, the fact is that if, you know, phenomena like what Rupert Sheldrake calls morphic resonance in biology are real, or if telepathy and uh, psychokinesis are real, genetic engineering researchers and AI researchers are going to run into these phenomena as bottlenecks in their R&D programs, okay? So there's going to be a point past which it is no longer possible for mainstream scientific researchers to marginalize this type of data. They're going to encounter it as an engineering bottleneck. And so I, I really wouldn't draw any legitimate distinction between the full flowering of the technological singularity and um, a society where uh, our latent psychic abilities and our spiritual potential, if you want to put it that way, is fully recognized. I mean, these are ultimately going to be inextricable from one another. Yep. Uh, we, we cannot successfully navigate the technological singularity without also going through what I call the spectral revolution. And vice versa. And this is my problem with a lot of, uh, how can I put it, overly transcendental Eastern paths to enlightenment and wisdom. Is that, sure... You know, there is a, a meditation protocol for the cultivation of siddhis in tantric Hinduism or in Vajrayana Buddhism, right? Where you have these lamas that develop various siddhis 
um, or tantrikas that you know cultivate various cities, superpowers as it were. But they do that with nothing close to the rigor and exquisite competence and trainable repeatability that the cultivation of these latent human, human abilities will have on the other side of the spectral revolution. And that really adequate scientific empirical grasp uh, of you know, telepathy, clairvoyance, psychokinesis that's going to come from grappling with these phenomena in the course of AI research or genetic engineering research is just on a whole other level than what's been achieved, uh, you know, th through the course of, of various, you know, mystical paths to enlightenment, you know, in the East. Um, and so, you know, I, I would say that, to go back to the Faustian and Faustian futurism, that in a way, you know, um, although it is a kind of devil's bargain, it's the Faustian path toward enlightenment that actually is going to allow us to delve most deeply into the hidden capacities, you know, of the human spirit. Let's unpack this in more detail. Relate to us the relationship between the Faustian futurist, Prometheism, spectral revolution. Unpack that in more detail for us. Yeah, well, so the spectral revolution, again, is the idea that, you know, we are going to um, move beyond materialistic, mechanistic, reductionistic science. We're going to move beyond a science that's constrained by particular paradigms, right? So I reject this idea that, you know, the Cartesian paradigm or whatever you want to call it, you know, the modern mechanistic paradigm of contemporary science is going to be rejected in favor of some new paradigm that explains telepathy or psychokinesis on the basis of quantum mechanics. That's an overly reductive way of thinking about it. It's not like you can use quantum mechanics to explain parapsychology. It's that telepathy and psychokinesis and clairvoyance and so forth are consistent with a world that's described by quantum physics. You would expect phenomena like that in the kind of world that's described by quantum physics. But the promise of taking the data of parapsychology seriously is far more than simply a shift to a new paradigm. It's a shift to post-paradigmatic science that's at stake here, at being able to think outside of a commitment to any one box, right? Not to get rid of the boxes, not to get rid of the atlases or maps of reality, but to be able to flip facilely between them for various practical purposes. There it is. And, and therefore have an even more radical empiricism, as William James would have put it, right? And so I think that kind of radical empiricism is characteristic of both the Faustian and of the Promethean, both the figure of the alchemist Faust that Goethe draws from the European Middle Ages and the figure of Prometheus, you know, the Titan who... Uh, gives the gift of technological science to humanity and who martyrs himself for the sake of humanity's liberation from the tyrannical Olympian gods. Both of these figures, Prometheus and Faust, could be seen as emblematic of this kind of radical empiricism that I think is the destiny of the West. But there are significant differences between the two figures in that Faust is the kind of Although, you know, Mary Shelley titled Frankenstein the modern Prometheus. Really, Frankenstein, Dr. Frankenstein is more a Faust-like figure. The Faustian figure doesn't care so much about social welfare or the good of humanity or general enlightenment. He's this mad scientist locked up in his own laboratory attempting to, uh, you know, uh, unlock the secrets of the universe for the sake of his own empowerment and... Um, electrification, not to say enlightenment, uh, to, to basically become a lightning rod for himself, for his own sake. And so there's an egotism there that's not as characteristic of the Promethean, right? The idea of the Promethean involves a humanistic self-sacrifice. I mean, Prometheus is the first martyr god in history. The um, martyr savior of humanity aspects of the Christ figure are not just prefigured by Prometheus. They are, they are, well, I have to say it, knockoffs of the Promethean Christ 
is aping Prometheus insofar as he's the savior of humanity, right? So there is an altruism in the figure of Prometheus, uh, which makes the quest for enlightenment and for empowerment through understanding the secrets of nature inseparable from service to humanity and uh, inseparable from uplifting of humanity and liberation ultimately of humanity from being bound to you know serve any um, overlords whether they're the Promethean, oh, sorry, whether they're the Olympian pantheon or whether they're the, the devas of the Hindu tradition. Because you know the, the Olympian pantheon and the uh, Vedic pantheon have exactly the same root. They're both, they're both um, devolutions of the primordial Aryan pantheon, right? And they're not fundamentally distinct from each other in their basic qualities. And so... The Promethean Rebellion is a rebellion against any kind of uh, pantheon that would set itself over and above humanity, against any kind of divine or heavenly overlords. Um, and that's an altruistic mission of service to humanity at large, that kind of rebellion for the sake of general liberation uh, is much more characteristic of the Promethean than it is of the Faustian. Although I'd say, again, both of these... Um, iterations of, of this archetype of the God-man sage figure, right? Both of them uh, are somehow emblematic of the radical empiricism characteristic of Western civilization. But I think that the Promethean with its humanistic altruism can be to an extent an antidote to the kind of pathological Faustianism that has thus far dominated the destiny of the West. Okay. Okay, let's table Promethean Prometheism being an antidote to some of the radical Faustian pathology that has developed from the West as the next thing. This one is on the in that spectral revolution in the idea of as is currently being popularized by Elon Musk with Neuralink the idea of being telepathic and all of these other both parapsychological phenomena that you spoke of earlier as well as in the in the mystic traditions and in even in the human development and psychological development it's from ego to the social and ethno and world level and then you get to these transpersonal and non-dual states so and i love the way that you sort of talk about on a even on a on a physics level even sir roger penrose who won the nobel prize in physics in 2020 has a cyclic cosmological Theory. So even the cutting edge of physics is now talking about eternity and cyclicity mm -hmm. and these types of things, which is fascinating now to see that synthesis happening. On a quantum mechanical level, I like how you place in these sort of Neuralink style phenomena right in a harmonic interplay with that radical emergence of physicalism as we see, which is really very energetic. And also the ability to shift between these maps for whatever uses we want is really cool. I'm vibing on that a lot. Which are ultimately like layers of the same map. Yeah. Let me just interject one thing briefly. Don't Please. lose your train of thought. Please. Neuralink is going to run into problems. Not in its early stages, but the more um, comprehensive this lattice becomes as it weaves itself into the quantum computer that's the human brain, uh, the more dysfunctional the system is going to be because it's not taking into account what they're going to initially call anomalous data transfer. They're going to see that telepathy 
takes place all the time on a subconscious level. Mm. Uh, clairvoyant impressions take place mm. all the time on a subconscious level. People are reacting to impressions that they have that they're not consciously processing that are not being processed through the recognized five senses, uh, but that are being processed by the quantum computer that's the brain. And so there are going to be glitches in, in the Neuralink system, the more advanced that it, it becomes, um, that are going to force the engineers uh, that, that you know, Elon Musk is uh, uh, you know, funding to look seriously at the same type of phenomena that parapsychologists have been studying for a century. I would go out on a limb and predict that that's going to happen within the next 15 to 20 years. Yeah. It's inevitable that in the next couple of decades that science and spirituality are going to come into this much more deep synthesis. And what you just listed is absolutely present in our day to day where we talk about it on a vibe where you can feel the vibe and that there are so many examples like this that are going to end up becoming more and more scientifically engaged with in a sense it's like a big edge of knowledge and planting flags mm -hmm. beyond the edge and then using the scientific method and synthesize that with the spiritual mysticism and trying to get to that flag and yeah. validate it and just doing that. Yeah. And just to be clear, you know, I'm not uh, saying that, you know, Neuralink is going to run into these problems from the perspective of a Luddite who wants the research program to fail and for these uh, spiritual capacities of mankind to prevail over mechanical technology. No, no, no. What's going to happen is they're going to iron out the problems by taking parapsychology data seriously, and you're going to have technologically augmented telepathy. That's going to be the end result of it. Mm -hmm. And so now would probably be a good time to say that where you have a style of pretty hardcore you've talked about this before as a breakaway civilization where there's a a bifurcation of the haves and the have nots and the haves go off into the singularity meanwhile the have nots suffer and in this case it would be that would it be that then Prometheism is trying to get the, the roots of which we are collectively harmonizing on to be of the greatest ethics and morals and wisdoms so that we can all enter into the singularity or the recursion yeah or prometheism the is an attempt to make sure that there isn't this um radical bifurcation of human society uh and that there isn't an attempt made to disempower humanity at large and the way i see the breakaway civilization is as an elite of corporatists military industrialists people in intelligence increasingly people in the big tech world who have reached the conclusion that humanity at large is neither prepared for the technological singularity nor for the spectral revolution. And so they're going to maintain a monopoly on singularity level technologies, which as I suggested earlier, these technologies are going to force uh, us to go through the spectral revolution if they're pursued to their culmination, right? And so they want to maintain a monopoly on singularity level technologies and take them out of the public domain by engaging in a controlled demolition of industrial society, a, a program of deliberate deindustrialization of the planet and the establishment of a neo-feudal uh, form of culture on this earth, okay, with themselves as the feudal lords. And so, you know, I, look, it's a tall order for us to prove them wrong because if you look at the state of society today, uh, I think a very strong case can be made that people are neither prepared for the technological singularity nor for the spectral revolution, right? So defeating the breakaway civilization is about demonstrating um, that there are at least significant groups of people uh, who are capable of presenting an achievable vision of social reorganization that will allow us to constructively navigate 
uh, both the achievement of singularity level technologies in a way that won't compromise human individuality and creativity, yep. and also to navigate the spectral revolution, to navigate the recognition, mainstream scientific recognition of ESP, psychokinesis, without winding up with something like the Salem witch burnings again and yep. mass hysteria, you know, where yep. your neighbor is accusing you of hexing uh, your family and so on and so forth. So that sounds like something we can get behind. Yes. Yeah. So that's the program of Prometheus. Yes. In a nutshell. Yes. Okay. So the, the components are that we have a singularity level technologies emerging and to benevolently on behalf of the whole share in that abundance while not sacrificing the individual and the creativity. Well, for that to happen, we need an evolutionary leap to take place. And unpack that for us, yeah. Evolution always involves selection and selection against. Evolution is a harvest, right? I mean, in nature, nature is, is brutal. And so we are reaching a point where we're capable of self-directed evolution, where instead of natural selection, there's artificial selection taking place. And Prometheism is a way of thinking that's opposed to some occulted elite being the arbiters of selection and self-selecting a group of corporatists, military industrialists, and so forth to have a monopoly on these technologies and these techniques when we talk about psychical cultivation, right? And then shutting the rest of humanity from out of that development. And in fact, putting humanity back out to pasture as cattle, effectively, in a neo-agrarian, neo-feudal society that they look down on from Olympus, okay? Like, you know, that film Elysium, I don't know if you mm -hmm. saw that. Yeah. Worse than that, though. Mm -hmm. Worse than that. A world where we've been completely deindustrialized. And we're maintained effectively as a farm. So in order for that not to happen, we need to prove ourselves, we being planetary humanity, need to prove ourselves capable of an evolutionary leap. And we have a very limited time horizon for that. The one thing I agree with Kurzweil's crowd about is the time frame for the technological singularity. I disagree with a lot of their materialism and reductionism, but I agree in terms of the time frame of the singularity. And again, achieving the technological singularity or coming very close to it will trigger the spectral revolution. Mm -hmm. So we have about 30 years to get this straight. Okay, It's going to have to happen in this century. And that's an evolutionary pressure, that kind of constrained time frame given the type of transformation that has to take place on a social and an individual level that's an evolutionary selection pressure mm -hmm. even though it's now artificial rather than natural uh, and so what has to happen is a mutation and an evolutionary leap humanity has to mutate into a kind of superhumanity mm -hmm. okay like the x-men mm -hmm. that has to happen if that doesn't happen the breakaway civilization is justified they're justified I will rest my case. Okay. So either humanity proves itself. And again, evolution is a selective process. So there is the mutation which is selected for, and then that mutation becomes the matrix for a new form of life. And then there are those who are selected against. And that's called extinction. So what we're facing is the extinction of humanity and the evolutionary leap into a superhuman form of life what we need to do before we get to the point where you know we take that leap is we need to to think very deeply about what it is about humanity that we want to preserve right? what are those characteristics of humanity that really presage the superhuman uh, that are in effect um uh, Frederick Myers, the, the psychical researcher, called them pre-versions. They're the opposite of atavisms. They're characteristics of a future form of life that you see presaged in an earlier form of life that hasn't really made the evolutionary leap yet into that next uh, stage of biological development. They're sort of latent 
structures that reflect a future morphology. It's like the, the characteristics of the butterfly that you already see in the caterpillar. So if individuality, creativity, our impulse for innovation and so forth, individuation are really characteristics of the butterfly that we haven't become yet, that we already see in the caterpillar, we want to make sure that as we develop artificial uh, intelligence and as we are capable of reengineering the whole human genome, we don't lose those characteristics that we cherish about humanity. And that, in fact, those defining traits are the ones that are amplified through this evolutionary leap. Mm -hmm. What would be our main signals that are indicating to us that a breakaway civilization is looming and that there is a X-Men style evolutionary leap that has to happen in order for the fruits of that technological singularity to be maximized and shared. Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what you mean in the way that you formulated the question. If you mean what, okay, because there's two questions potentially packed into that. Uh, one question, the way I hear it, uh, seems to be what's the evidence for a breakaway civilization? The other question is, um, what is the evidence for the fact that there needs to be an evolutionary leap? Uh, let me take the second one first, because that just requires a reiteration of what, I, what I've already and, said, and, which and, is that... And actually, then it's probably unneeded, because I also understand that the evolutionary leap, regardless, is something that is beautiful, and it's something that is, again following a timeline of just a couple of decades here of the increasing technologization of the planet and the augmentation of the humanoid to a level that is unparalleled. And so that is clear. Yeah, there's an acceleration and convergence of technological developments that all have the potential to fundamentally alter the basic parameters of human existence into something that is no longer humanity as we understand it. And so now the questions merge in the sense of what's then the... Now the breakaway civilization... The evidence, f yeah, that, right. that that evolutionary leap is to counter... Right, the breakaway, breakaway civilization breakaway. idea as an idea is that... Okay, so this is an important start, the fact that you say well, that this is an idea. We could say two things. Yeah. First of all, let's just take it as an idea to begin with. Okay. Right. The idea of a breakaway civilization with respect to the technological singularity and the spectral revolution is that given how economy and industry and um, the intelligence aspects of the government are structured, right, where you have long term planning in corporations, much more long term planning than you do in government and where you have uh, significant foresight in the intelligence community. Right. I mean, the NSA's computers are about 30 years ahead in terms of their processing power than what's in the public sphere and have been consistently. And this gives them tremendous projective power. So the idea of the breakaway civilization is that an elite of corporatists, industrialists, people in intelligence would have seen this coming and they would have prepared for it, right? And what would be their incentive to just hoard the benefits of the technological singularity to protect themselves from a general collapse and descent into violent chaos as in the eight billion are not ready as they're not ready they're going to tear themselves apart and they're going to tear us apart in the process and we have vested interests and so to protect our interests Isn't that like a compulsive fear-based thinking yes that, and so that, i'm calling for us to resist them that the eight billion are no, not i don't ready? like this way of thinking okay. and i don't want these people to be the arbiters of the destiny of humanity okay that having been said if we prove incapable of that evolutionary leap, their thinking will have been justified. Okay, and to prove capable of the evolutionary leap is to... Right. Come now, together. that's the idea of a breakaway civilization. The empirical case for a breakaway civilization, you know, is, is something that, I mean, the proof is in the pudding. You have to really lay it out. And in um, an essay I wrote called Black Sunrise, which was published in my anthology Lovers of Sophia, um, I present evidence for a um, secret industrial development program that extends into a secret space program 
from the time that the uh, basically brain trust of Nazi Germany was imported into the United States through Project Paperclip. That in 1947, when you know the Central Intelligence Agency, which was, by the way, co-constituted uh, through absorbing the entire Nazi German uh, Eastern European spy network, when the CIA brought all these thousands of Nazi scientists into the United States, not just rocket scientists, as we're often led to believe, but all kinds of social engineers and psychologists and so forth. Um, and when the corporatists who were funding the Third Reich from North America, people like Ford and the Carlyles and the Astors and the Rockefellers, you know, Rockefeller... Uh, you also gave evidence for J.P. Morgan. And Rockefeller Morgan. and J.P. Morgan were the principal financiers of Nazi Germany from out of New York. So what I argue in Black Sunrise and then expand upon in Prometheism is that beginning in 1947, you had this military, industrial, corporate culture develop uh, within the black projects of the United States that ultimately spawned a civilization in its own right, which considers itself distinct from not just Western civilization, but terrestrial civilization at large, and has developed a very elitist uh, mentality. Okay, They're extremely alienated from the planetary society at large, and they intend to secure their own survival and their own interests. Um, and... You know, people often refer to this as the military-industrial complex in the United States. What they don't understand is that it's not really American. It is uh, fundamentally constituted by imported uh, German National Socialists um, and, and a few other people from Axis power countries, Italians and so forth. Uh, but this, this thing was basically imported lock, stock and barrel from Germany, and it has extended its tentacles throughout the military, industrial, corporate, and intelligence world. I would argue that the deepest part of what today is referred to as the deep state is really this breakaway civilization. And that it has evolved, if we want to use that word, or let's just say developed, not to use the word evolved, right? It has developed to the point where it has an independent base of economic productivity uh, and industrial development, probably off planet as well, probably on the moon and in other places beyond the earth. Uh, involving propulsion technologies that have been kept out of the public sphere. And let me just make a side note here with respect to propulsion technologies. This is another aspect of the technological singularity that calls for a dramatic and rapid transformation of human psychology. Um, you can take the same engine that produces anti-gravity, a zero-point energy drive that produces... Uh, uh, a, a local gravitational field and allows for the type of propulsion that we see in unidentified flying objects, you can take that same engine and you can turn it into a bomb far more destructive than the worst thermonuclear weapon. It would become an implosion device, a, a kind of uh, a, a, an artificially produced singularity on the surface of the Earth which would have a destructive force far greater than that of any nuclear weapon, right? So, yes, it's true that you could put one of these generators in everybody's backyard and we would all have free energy and we would be beyond fossil fuel. And, you know, you could have, you know, Jetsons cars that are hovering through the air with anti-gravity technology zipping through the skies of all of our cities. But anyone can use artificial intelligence and his trusty robot in his, in, in his garage to make the necessary modifications to this engine to transform it into a bomb that can wipe out an entire continent, right? I mean, this is the kind of dual use that we've had a problem with in terms of nuclear energy yeah. throughout the 20th century. The potential for misuse here is of an, another order of magnitude altogether. Uh, it's far more dangerous than turning a nuclear power plant into the basis for development of a nuclear weapon. Uh, so, and it's much easier to do. And the technology will be much more ubiquitous and the know-how to transform that energy device into a weapon will also be much more ubiquitous. So again, until and unless we can make this evolutionary leap, as cynical as it may sound, the breakaway civilization is entirely justified in concealing this kind of propulsion technology. Is there a...
a bit of Darwinian metaphysics that is at play here. That sort well, of, to hell with Darwin. I mean, you know, Darwin it, only co-developed the theory of evolution with Alfred Wallace. Alfred Wallace was a co-developer of the theory of evolution, and Wallace did not dismiss the spiritual. Let's right? say a selection at the metaphysical level. Yeah, is just yeah. Easier I to would say. I would say so. So um, and so that's what's at stake. Yeah. Okay. So it's fascinating because about six months ago or so. I was so fascinated with selection at the metaphysical level, at this universal level. And I'm still very fascinated with it. Yet my, my Satori around non-duality, especially, has made it a lot more... chill mm -hmm. sure as in we are eternal and it continues yeah i wouldn't bank on that and the so you have to define who the we is and, to, there when you make that kind of statement well there in a sense the The breakaway civilization is not separate from the absolute than the 7.9 billion that are not part of that. Look. Does that it, make the, sense? Yeah, no, absolutely. Look, okay. if you let's let's put it this way. If you want to say that by doing this, the breakaway civilization will go against the Tao. And this is not good because, you know, this is like when you stand up against the water in, in the Tao Te Ching, right? You know, that something that stands firm in an ossified, calcified way will be shattered by an oncoming wave, right? Um, if the breakaway civilization is turning against the Tao when it bifurcates humanity in this way and, you know, engages in a controlled demolition of industrial civilization on this planet, puts us all back out to pasture. Well, sure, maybe the Tao will catch up with them eventually. I don't want to have to wait. 3,000 years or 30,000 years to see the interstellar civilization that they found based on this kind of a mistake ultimately collapse. It may collapse. It may be disharmonious. It may be built on a fundamental disharmony on an Achilles heel that ultimately leads to its demise. I would rather prevent that whole devolution from taking place. And if I may also provide another framework that is multi-layered to see how it resonates in the most absolute sense everything is already indescribable perfection in the most absolute sense we already are perfect whole complete unconditionally free that's a very consoling thought it's one more layer yeah the next layer is a very dualistic concession mm -hmm. to that non-dual, which is that there are very clearly a, a yin and yang that are in flux mm -hmm. in an ascension towards an attractor. And that in this case, we could in the story portray the breakaway civilization as that dark, and that these 7.9 billion taking this evolutionary leap as the light. And the also in that dualistic concession is the suffering and the well-being. So in the non-dual layer is an indescribable perfection where that duality doesn't exist. And in the dualistic concession is where there's suffering and there's well-being where you describe how the evolutionary leap enables the utmost utopian style flourishing abundance well-being prosperity for all right thumbs ups yeah now for that latter 
to be achievable, the former has to be rejected. That's what I would present to you. Is that what I would submit to you is that the sense of equanimity that comes from this sense that everything is already perfect, that has to be rejected in order for this utopian transformation of society to be something that we strive for. And that's what's differentiated the West from the East throughout the course of history. And I would further add that the kinds of subtle states of mind that, for example, Gautama Buddha describes in, in the form that we get in the Tripitaka, in the, the, the oldest sermons that are attributable to Gautama, when he goes into descriptions of, of uh, subtle states of mind that are able to perceive the codependent arising of all phenomena and able to see through the illusion of the self, right? Because in Buddhism, I mean, this is a really complex, uh, you know, mind-boggling idea that although there's rebirth, there's no self, that, you know, the strands of the persona are being rewoven from lifetime to lifetime without any indestructible core that would be eternal, right? So I think that what you are inclined to describe as an eternal perfection is a projection. It's a, it is a psychological, moral projection, valuation um, that you are coloring a much more complex and ineffable uh, experience with. Okay, the, the experience that you're projecting onto when you describe the infinite perfection of the present moment is the experience uh, of what Gautama called codependent origination and no self. And, you know, this is where the big break happened between Buddhism and Hinduism is in this critique that Gautama leveled both at the idea of an imperishable eternal self and at the idea of a cosmic consciousness that's abiding and perfect, namely Brahman. So, you know, Buddha, I think, very rightly deconstructs this mirroring of the Atman and the Brahman and says that both of these are projections onto something that is truly ineffable, unfathomable, okay? And that, that I don't want to call it a thing, that no thing, I mean, that's the nothingness, the shunyata, the no-thingness. That no-thingness, that which is ungraspable, is a state that the mind is introspectively capable of entering because our minds are quantum phenomena. And it's the nature of, of quantum physical processes that we are proprioceptively experiencing in that state. Your description of it as... Uh, perfection in the present moment or infinite perfection or, you know, what's eternally beautiful or complete is a, is a human moral projection onto it. It's a moralistic human projection onto it, which gives you a sense of tranquility and uh, groundedness. Um, and Buddha, I think, rightly tried to take that ground out from under people, okay, um, and, and make them enter the void, and I am very much aligned with him on that. Um, and I think that it's interesting when you look at Martin Heidegger's thought, you know, the last great thinker in the trajectory of Western philosophy, you see that Heidegger's meditations on nothingness very closely converge with what the Buddha is saying, with the huge difference being that the primary concern of Heidegger's philosophical thought was understanding the essence of technological science. So... That trajectory where, you know, Heidegger's meditations on nothingness converge with Buddha's deconstruction of substance and, and the permanent and the eternal, that convergence between the East and the West is, I think, exactly where we need to go, uh, you know, in the, in, in the intellectual and spiritual sphere as we try to navigate the technological singularity and the spectral revolution successfully. One of the core things that came up there was that this agentless, attributeless, metaphysical zero, absolute, is. 
It just is. And this is the appearance. Sure. That's a horrifying experience, though. If you ever actually had that experience, it's not really consoling. I what makes it I consoling is a human projection onto it. I completely disagree. My, my take on it is that that is the piercing of the veil to the source that enables the absolute highest morality to channel through. And so that inward path, whether it be the Atma Vichara, the self abiding, or whether it be the parable of the prodigal son, or any of these, again, very perennial wisdoms of going all the way inward to the source, it creates a very natural Wu Wei effortless action in all of the tantric path that Sahaja Samadhi, where you weave your realizations into the social fabric of the dream of the illusion of the appearance. Now I purposely gave these layers where there's the most non-dual layer. And then there's the layer that is the dualistic concession. And in doing so, it paints a landscape that is true simultaneity in a sense. And I definitely feel and resonate with how you say that in the dualism to completely reject the non-dual makes this hyper awareness towards the absolute architecting toward the light, that evolutionary leap that's needed. Yet at the same time, I recognize that what is most true in that simultaneity is the non-dual and also what is true is that when the piercing of the veil to the source occurs the natural flow just like with me and so many others is a effortless action, a Wu Wei that comes through to do those light architectures that are needed in that dualistic concession to make that evolutionary leap that then makes a much more harmonic technological singularity. How do, does that make sense? Yeah, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I think that it does not necessarily follow from experiencing that's sim- what you described as simultaneity. It does not necessarily follow that you will live a life you could characterize as Wu Wei and that that kind of attitude, fundamental attitude, um, is the only one that's going to be able to allow us to successfully navigate the technological singularity. In fact, I would go so far as to suggest that an overemphasis of that kind of an attitude, which again, doesn't necessarily follow from a direct experience of what you're calling simultaneity, that kind of attitude could be really deleterious. And, you know, there's a reason why Chinese civilization did not lead to the technological singularity. Uh, and it's probably related to the reason why Chinese civilization should not be allowed to uh, determine the ways in which we design policies that allow us to avoid the most dangerous pitfalls um, that we could face in the course of the technological singularity. Uh, you know, this is why, again, I reach back to Prometheus as an archetype. I agree with Martin Heidegger that the solution has to come from out of the problem. Um, that the, pro- the, the problem, the challenge that we face, the challenge that Western man has forced the rest of the planet to face through this world in framing, world colonizing technological science, that challenge cannot be adequately addressed from out of the metaphysical resources of uh, another culture or civilization. It has to be transformed in its own essence. 
And so we have to go back to the Promethean fountainhead of technological science in order to bring about an inversion and a reorientation of the techno-scientific from a mindset that's based on instrumentalization, on domineering control, into a mindset that expresses that other dimension of techne that the Greeks understood, namely poesis or poetic creation, creativity, uh, the kind of innovation that's inseparable from the arts. And you know, you see this complementarity of techne as technical control and techne as poetry in effect in all of the great uh, Renaissance men throughout the course of the history of science and of the arts, you know, all the way from Leonardo da Vinci to Nikola Tesla. So this is one of the reasons why I reach back to the Promethean, because I don't think that the Wu Wei attitude is what is going to save us from some of the most horrific prospects um, intrinsic to this evolutionary moment in our history. I think we need to transform the, the salvation, the salvific force has to come from out of the danger. Okay, it, it has to come from uh, the same matrix, the same metaphysical ontological matrix that gave rise to Western technological science. And it may, ve it may very well be a idea that there is a breakaway civilization and that there is a evolutionary leap that needs to happen as in it could very well be just a natural harmonic unfolding that is happening that is also. I don't think that's fair to say because it's not it, it, on an aesthetic level in terms of aesthetic judgment in terms of you know describing the characteristics of something and painting a picture of what's going on in our history I don't think that's a fair statement to say because uh, there are moments both in geological and in biological history where there are dramatic ruptures uh, there you know not everything is a steady progression in nature in fact nature is, is catastrophic nature so, is punctuated by catastrophes and, and so is evolution as a biological process if you understand yourself as eternal then what at this moment is lacking? Everything. Everything is lacking? Yeah. Because that conception is so vacuous that everything is lacking. If you understand yourself as eternal in the sense that through that understanding, you are completely satisfied and achieve total equanimity so that you don't strive for anything see but that's not the that's not what happens it's not a it's not an the middle path or the middle way or the tantric path or sahaja samadhi or yeah. the goldilocks zone any of these understandings is all about taking what happens when you go all the way to your source and it's a very natural look i understand exactly expression what, uh, the, the of it towards those yeah. light architectures that we're talking about yeah. as in this expression mm -hmm. of source yeah. is not going to stop it's not going to stop suddenly undergoing the process well, of bringing look, these biggest questions yeah. to los angeles and doing these sure. other media projects sure. around the enlightenment and the awakening of yeah, civilization yeah. it's not just going to stop because ah non-duality fantastic now i do nothing no i right? get that's you. that's a very straw man perspective on the per, on non-duality well, and that's not what i'm saying at all it's a middle way right and so therefore if nothing is lacking right now and if that is Every, uh, it, much is lacking right now, it and that's, we're that's, terribly that, lacking. It is beautiful. Society that is lacking. Is, we're lacking on an individual level. We're, this conditions this are unacceptable. And Jason, they're this unacceptable. Is, this is it. Where on the most non-dual perspective, yeah. it's nothing is lacking. It's perfection. On the second level of the dualism, yeah. there is the there's suffering. There's all these sustainable uh -huh. development goals that we want to make. There is this. We want sure. to make this yeah. evolutionary no, I, yeah, leap. Yeah, I would turn that it. completely on its head. I would turn that completely on its head, and say that 
on some on some so very it's prioritizing the selection at the metaphysical level is what you would say you prioritize selection at the metaphysical level because no. you have a prioritization of telling the story about no, it's the... a priority in terms of the dimensions of human experience okay first of all i hear what you're saying okay and Likewise, much yeah. much more than much more than a description of it as wu wei I studied for some time the Dzogchen teachings in Tibetan Buddhism. Likewise. And this teaching of the, the doctrine of the great perfection to me is the clearest example of what you're talking about. But you have to understand that the Dzogchen lamas in Tibet made common cause with the SS. The SS went to Tibet. And Heinrich Himmler had a good working relationship with Dzogchen lamas who were totally prepared to ally in a military effort against the Chinese with Nazi Germany, okay? And even if you read the biography of Padma Sambhava and look at how he lived his life as a warrior and a conqueror and the kinds of ceremonies he performed in cremation grounds, okay, and in cemeteries in the middle of the night, there is no uh, moral conclusion that you can draw from an experience of perfection in the sense in which you're defining it or the Dzogchen teachings define it. All of that is a projection. That projection is influenced by individual psychology, by cultural heritage, so on and so forth. All right. I don't deny that there is this fair as somebody that studied the perennial wisdoms across those mystic traditions. I'm just surprised that it's being voiced as a as a psychological projection of some sort, rather than no, no, just no, no, a, no, no, no. a one uh, end. No, no, I, I, I'm not saying that the experience is a projection. I'm saying that the way in which you're characterizing its implications for how we live our lives and how it, you believe, can be constructive for society and for social development, that that's a projection onto a very real experience that can be had, an experience of no self, an experience of, I would say, quantum superposition, not to call it simultaneity, but an experience of uh, the world beyond chronological time, beyond the limits of sequential chronological time, right? Because we live in a world of quantum superposition where, uh, you know, the future doesn't follow the past in a sequential way. And it's possible for the mind to experience that. But there are no moral uh, implications that necessarily follow from that type of experience. Well, and so if we the, the want a better society, people, we have to strive for one. The reason why people say that God or self-realization is the most important service that you can render humanity, Ramana Maharshi and many others, is because what that does is it makes it so that when I look at Jason or when I look at Nassim or when I look at anybody, what happens is I see God. I see the self. I see the oneness, the sourceness. So well, I that's good, never, but you can do that while you drive hurt, a samurai sword through I, somebody. I would never hurt my own body, right? It makes no, no sense. I, I, I totally disagree. Look, I mean, you it's should look at you should look at some of the you should look at some of the the Zen masters who participated in the Japanese war effort in the Second World War. Right. Uh, some of the greatest Japanese Zen masters who were on the battlefields in Manchuria and so forth in the Second World War um, to understand how somebody like that and somebody like Padma Sambhava, who literally, you know, drove swords through people and, you know, filled them with arrows out of his quiver. OK, from rooftops, how it's entirely possible to look right into somebody's eyes and understand not only that he is not separate from you, but that neither of you really have any self as you drive the sword through the person's solar plexus. Oh, yeah. to, me, to me, there's a diamond of wisdom there. And that may also be a... a story that indicates something unique and special to the contribution of the conversation and collective, absolutely. Also, that the simultaneity where there's a recognition of all these layers that we've been talking about happening, where there is a perspective of a breakaway civilization, the perspective of the quantum leap or the evolutionary leap that needs to happen in order to 
maximize prosperity into the technological singularity while simultaneously everything is it just is and i love being able to hold that simultaneity and that's sort of what you could say is like synthesis level consciousness or mm-hmm. joseph in the coat of many colors level consciousness is where you take in these eight billion hermeneutics of truth and you hold them all simultaneously yeah in what's happening yeah look i think deconditioning the mind periodically is a great thing to do and one of the reasons why i chose prometheus as a an archetypal symbol for uh the movement that i'm trying to launch is because prometheus is not an all-knowing and an all-powerful god prometheus is a deity among other deities and in a prometheus society there's certainly a place for the buddhist path to enlightenment there's certainly a place for tantric yoga right um and i think that it's necessary to decondition the mind using these types of practices periodically but i don't think that should be done at the expense of a promethean striving for utopia for a radical transformation of society and for the call you know the furtherance uh of human evolution and in my understanding they don't happen separately from one another but together as one That's- again like i said it's necessary sometimes to decondition the mind especially if you're involved in this kind of titanic Promethean striving, uh, you know, on, on occasion, it's good to remind yourself that you don't really exist. <laughs> Jeez, this has been such a great convo. I super appreciate you. This has been fascinating on so many dimensions. I'm just so grateful. I agree. A lot of dynamic tension. Those are the best conversations. Yeah. 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 A lot of the, the tennis ball hitting back and forth was just really strong and, and, episode one hopefully of of many unpacking this yeah would be my pleasure we would love to have you back for more yeah do you feel satisfied like good time to to wrap yeah yeah, good? yeah yeah absolutely this is a solid end I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is a solid end we've reached the culmination yeah. as we are in uh as what we've described as well wow beautiful not a convergence but a culmination yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i love it All right. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate you. What an epic convo on metaphysics, geopolitics. So many things, so many things. Find the links in the bio below, jasonrezagiorgiani.com. You can support him there across all of his books. Also across joining him on a donation subscription so that he can continue doing his work. Prometheism.com as well, his Twitter profile, and also all of his books on Amazon. You can go and find those there. Like the video if it brought you value. Subscribe if you haven't already. And let us know how you feel in the comments below. But all of the epicness that was discussed, we'd love to hear from you. And simultaneously... Pierce the veil to your source and build that more abundant and prosperous future as we enter into that technological singularity. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you again, Jason. Been my pleasure, Alan. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you soon, everyone. Peace.